how do you remain focused and productive in the face of insurmountable work? Lists, mm. schedules, and I have help. I mean, my wife in particular in the last year has been unbelievably helpful. Like, I mean, it's become a full-time job for her, really, helping mm. me manage my schedule and mm. keep me on track. But a lot of it is, like, I get up in the morning, I have everything scheduled. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. There's a hierarchy of priority. Mm. And, and I'm really operating on a day-to-day -day level right now because there's so many things to do. I can't look more than about a day or two ahead, although it's, it's, it's basically scheduled. Mm. You know, but I learned to discipline myself when I was in graduate school, when I was writing. I, I wrote a book called Maps of Meaning that was published in 1999, and I worked for that on that for about 15 years, about three hours a day. And I really sort of grabbed myself by the scruff of the neck and like forced myself to learn how to concentrate without deviation. How do you do that? Oh. I mean, what do you, how, how do you how do you focus that intensely? Because I I often have trouble like I get overwhelmed sometimes when when I have a lot of work and the the worst feeling is like when I feel like I have a ton of work and I do work all day but I still feel like I didn't get anything done. Yeah, but you and probably I did. Time. You probably did. Probably. Are you a conscientious person? Do you know? We took the standard big five trait model which is the standard modern personality model so that's extroversion which is a positive emotion dimension and extroverted people are enthusiastic and assertive so you're both enthusiastic you're really assertive that would be my guess i can be yeah yeah well you wouldn't be doing this sort of thing yeah if okay. you want extra okay sure yeah so because you're verbally fluent and you like to engage in that sort of thing so that's a positive emotion dimension. It's associated with the positive emotion that you feel when you're moving towards desired things. Mm -hmm. And the next dimension is sometimes it's called neuroticism and sometimes it's called Lots negative emotionality. Well, Big on neuroticism. People who are high in neuroticism uh, have some anticipatory anxiety. You know, you know you have anticipatory anxiety if you're worried about going somewhere yep. and it really bugs you and then you get there and like 20 minutes later you're calm and it's okay. Big time. Every so, single yeah. time. Big time. <laughs> okay. Every week. Okay, okay. Yeah. So that's withdrawal. That's that's an aspect of, of neuroticism known as withdrawal. And the other aspect is volatility and volatile people are touchy and irritable. Huh. So that's the second dimension. The third dimension is agreeableness and agreeable people are compassionate and polite mm. okay. and disagreeable people are competitive and blunt mm. and so women are higher in agreeableness than men yeah. so if you take a random man and a random woman out of the population general population and you bet on who is more agreeable if you bet on the woman you'd be right 60 percent of the time and the other place where men and women differ is with trait neuroticism. Women are more susceptible to anxiety and depression. So, but how can you say that if genders don't exist? Well, <laughs> yeah, that, that's another thing yeah. that I'm general, genuinely <laughs> accused of is that biological essentialism. Yeah, then, but uh, what, I feel like I experiencing those different feelings depending on the day. Yeah, sometimes I'm more extroverted. Some days I'm more reclusive. Uh, is it generally? That's probably volatility too. It's like variation in mood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So have you ever had periods of depression? Yeah. How long? I mean, you don't have to tell me. No, I can tell you. It's okay. In college, I'd say a couple of years. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a long time. Well, yeah. so that would be an indication. Well, it could be an indication of many things, mm. but that's often associated with higher levels of trait neuroticism. Because you see, it isn't obvious how much negative emotion you should feel. Like, mm -hmm. let's say you wake up in the morning and you have an ache in your side. It's like, well, is that nothing or cancer? Mm -hmm. Well, you don't know. Like, you shouldn't jump to the whole cancer conclusion. Right. But it, I would. would. <laughs> well, but you can't tell. Eh? Like, it's yeah. not necessary. Like, and you think, well, if it is cancer and you miss it, well, that's not so good. Yeah. You know, so sometimes there's some utility in being on edge all the time, especially in a dangerous sure. environment. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the next dimension is conscientiousness, and conscientious people are industrious, and so they're guilty if they're not working. They have to work. Yeah, I have That's that. Me. You're like that. Me yeah, too. It's you brutal. Do. It's awful. It's I hate it. Yeah. Because I'm very self-aware of it. Like, um, I feel like I can never relax. Right. I feel like yeah. I never got anything done. Right, right. Okay, never so, so we figured out why that is, yeah. okay? The reason is, is you're conscientious, mm. so... That, that's associated often with, well, feelings of shame or guilt if you haven't got what you should have got done. Mm -hmm. And then if you're also high in negative emotion, then you worry about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that can be rough. And the last dimension is openness. And openness is basically interest in ideas and creativity, essentially. You're open and your partner isn't. Well, you're going to want to go to plays and movies and read books and discuss ideas. And they're not going to be interested in that at all. And, you know, you kind of think of those as opinions, but they're really deeply rooted. Are we doomed to, to 
just possess these characteristics that we hate about ourselves, even if we're self-aware of it? How do, no. you, how do you address these issues of self-improvement? Okay, well, people get more conscientious and more and less neurotic and more agreeable as they get older. So you could think about that perhaps as the development of wisdom. I also think that you can, you can learn the opposite traits through practicing micro habits. So for example, in my clinical practice, I've often had introverted people who need to act in an extroverted way in order, say, to be successful lawyers because they have to go out and drum up business. They have to meet with people. Right. And they can learn the habits of an extroverted person, but they have to learn them from the bottom up. Mm. It's, it's not natural to them. And if you're not very conscientious, for example, like a schedule is learning how to use a, a schedule and then learning how to stick to it can be really useful, as can making a life plan. I'm aware of my flaws. I'm aware of the things that drive me crazy, but I'm not really sure how to improve it, right? I don't know. I'm not. Maybe that's the problem is that I don't know how to instruct myself to 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 improve. Well, one of the things, okay, so think about your life along six or seven dimensions okay so here here's the idea imagine you were treating yourself like someone you were taking care of you know someone you loved and you were taking care of mm. okay so you want the best for you mm. whatever that is so it's not like magic wishes it's nothing like that it's you're taking care of yourself like a responsible person okay so then right a bit three to five years down the road what do you want your friendship network to look like how do you want your intimate relationship to be going or what should it look like how are you going to stay educated how are you going to handle temptations of drugs and alcohol? Are you going to keep yourself healthy mentally and physically? What are your career goals? And what are you going to do with life outside of work? You know, so if, if you could have what would be good for you, just what would that look like? Mm -hmm. Okay, people aren't encouraged to take the time to think that through. And it really matters right. if you think it through. Okay, now, write for 20 minutes about what your life could look like in three to five years if it was going the way that you wanted it to go. So it'd be good for you. Be good for you, good for your family, good for society. Like, it'd be good. You need a vision. Okay, and then the next step is, okay, now imagine that you let your weaknesses and character flaws get the upper hand and, like, drive you into the ground. What does that look like in five years? So that's like a horrific vision, right? And so that's a good thing, because now you've got something to run away from. And so if you're anxious, having something bad to run away from is really motivating, because you think, well, you know, like, maybe I should watch what I eat. It's like, yeah, well, I'd look better. That's not enough motivation. I'm going to be fat and really unhealthy and half dead in five years. It's like, okay, that's not so good. Right. You know, and so you can run towards the positive thing and run away from the negative thing. That increases your motivation. Right. And then in the next part, you make that into a detailed and articulated plan. And so that can help like you say, well, you're not sure what habits to change or, or, or what, what, what personality traits to transform. You got to kind of think about that in relationship to what you want.